the renowned City of London, home to the UK government and the UK's financial district, is a leading global city with strengths in many areas. London's diverse range of cultures and religions make it truly unique with over 300 languages spoken within its boundaries. The inaugural Zafrullah Khan lecture organised by the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation in conjunction with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community took place in this very famous city of London. The event held at King's College Strand Campus set a historic milestone as the place for the very first Zafrullah Khan lecture. King's College located on the Strand is central to London. Within minutes walking distance you find some very famous landmarks including the Royal Courts of Justice which houses the High Court of Justice for England and Wales, India House home to the Indian High Commission in London, Australia House home to the Australian High Commission in London and Somerset House a major arts and cultures centre. Through the years some well-renowned faces have gained their education at King's College London South Africa's Archbishop, Rev. Desmond Tutu, was one of these faces. He was well known for his humanitarian efforts, receiving several peace prizes from different nations. The very famous Sir Muhammad Zafrullah Khan was once a student at King's College University. Just some of his achievements included President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, a distinguished scholar in the world of religions, President and Judge of the International Court of Justice and the first Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Co-Director of ICSR, Dr. John Bew, welcomed attendees with his opening remarks at King's College University's Council Room. During the academic year we established um, an essay prize competition with su the support of the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim Association in the UK and the purpose of the project we agreed with them was to encourage new scholarship and a platform for fresh ideas in the study of radicalisation and political violence and to bring an international perspective uh, to this work. The Ahmadiyya community in the United Kingdom have shown a consistent uh, commitment to supporting education in the UK uh, and particularly higher education institutes and I know they, they fund a lot of similar projects in, in Oxford and Cambridge as well as uh, in London universities and this is on the one hand a continuation of that. Uh, moreover, on the other hand, th uh, through their new all-parliamentary all group and recent events in Westminster and the European Parliament, uh, which I attended uh, with them last week, they have been heavily involved in both interfaith dialogue and in countering extremism, extremism in the UK and in Europe, from wherever it comes across the political spectrum. Uh, and tonight's event really then captures the combination of these two efforts. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking the Amadea Association in the UK, uh, in particularly their chairman, uh, Rafiq Hayat, who's here tonight, uh, and welcoming the members of their community uh, here this evening. Uh, I'd also like to explain very briefly why we decided to call the event um, the Zafar Khan Lecture. Um, Sir Mohammed Zafar Khan was a Pakistani politician, diplomat and an international jurist who was known particularly for his representation of Pakistan at the United Nations and in the, in the international community. Uh, in his early career he was heavily involved in the political struggle for Indian, Indian independence and in 1939 he led the Indian delegation to the League of, League of Nations. Uh, upon the independence of Pakistan he became the country's first foreign minister. Uh, after that, he had a number of prominent international positions. He served as president of the UN General Assembly and was the first Asian president of the International Court of Justice. And what is even more pertinent, if you like, for tonight's event is that Zafar Khan was not only a distinguished member of the Ahmadiyya community uh, in Pakistan, but also an, a distinguished alumnus of King's College London, where he studied for his law degree in the 1910s uh, before um, moving to the, being called to the bar. So we could think of no better title for the event. Uh, it's also a very useful synergy that tonight's guest speaker is also an alumnus of King's College London and also more specifically an alumnus of the very same 
Law Department. Uh, Baron Carlyle of Berryu is a liberal, liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords. He graduated from King's in 1969, very exciting years. Uh, and after being uh, called to the bar at Gray's Inn, he became a QC at the very young age of 36. Uh, he also simultaneously managed to combine this with a distinguished political career. He became a Liberal Democrat MP for Montgomeryshire in 1983 and was created a life peer in 1999 as Lord, Lord Carlyle of Berrieu. Uh, as most of you will know, since 2005, Lord Carlyle has acted as the independent reviewer of counterterrorism legislation in the UK. And in 2011, he was in charge of the independent oversight uh, for the government's review of its prevent strategy. Uh, he will speak on a moment um, in relation to that experience on the topic of recent changes in counterterrorism's law and experts' perspective. Um, but I'd also like to say tonight is a prize giving and in the previous months we um, commissioned and, and made a call for a, for, a, for a prize for students engaged in higher education. Um, and um, the, the, the topic of the, the prize um, the, 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 the essay question was, the answer to Pakistan's sectarian crisis uh, is reviving Jinnah's vision for the country. Do you agree? It was answered very effectively, even more very effectively and, and delightfully for us. It was won by a King's student uh, from the War Studies Department. So very briefly, uh, before I hand over to Lord Carlyle, I'd like to um, um, hand over a little uh, envelope uh, to the winner, Iona Eben, who's a, a recent graduate of the Master's Programme at the War Studies Department at King's. I can do that very briefly. Forgive me for stripping down to my shirt sleeves. As an old alumnus of this place, I'm actually rather more dressed than I used to be in my student days here, uh, certainly more formally, but it's hot, and if anyone else feels like stripping down, then please do so. Um, can I start by uh, a couple of uh, plaudits? First of all, can I congratulate uh, Iona Evan on winning this prize? It's a very significant and quite new prize and makes a, a, a real contribution to thinking in the area of um, uh, the way in which we approach other countries and the whole global issue of terrorism. So congratulations to Iona. I've asked Iona to join me during the Q&A session, which will be available, I hope, after I finish speaking. Uh, so if you have any questions to ask her about the subject of her essay or anything within her area of expertise, please prepare so to do. Um, the uh, talk I'm going to give uh, honours the memory of Sir Zafrullah, Zafrullah Khan, who, as you've heard, like me, is an alumnus of King's College London. What I can promise you is that although he studied here some time before me, he studied in the same dismal buildings in which our excellent law faculty conducted its affairs, I think until this year probably, um, when new prom premises were made available. And it's a privilege for me and always a pleasure to come here, particularly as I'm now a fellow of King's College London. I also want to pay my respects to the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK, who make a very well known and distinguished contribution to issues of partnership, equality, peace, and anti de radicalization in the United Kingdom. We, we honor the work that you do, sir, and are grateful to you for your support. Um, I have one other plug to give, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with the subject of um, this evening. I have started reading Dr. John Bew's recently published biography of Castlereagh. It's, a, it's magnificent, um, very readable, and I thoroughly recommend it to uh, anyone, and that cost you dinner. Yeah. Um, um, now, I just wanted to say a few words, too, about the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence here, because it goes, what I want to say about it goes to the heart of my views about radicalization, anti-radicalization, partnership of communities in the United Kingdom and indeed throughout Europe and the world. Um, the ICSR is a fantastic partnership because it, it's not just Kings on its own. Kings on its own is good enough for me, um, but it does much more. 
Um, it works with um, four other academic institutions around the world, very different ones in Pennsylvania, in Israel, in Jordan, and in Georgetown in America. And it has affiliates in Delhi, New Delhi, and in Pakistan. How we need those kinds of partnership. It is organizations like this, and I merely pick one, on, one other at random, the Wolf Institute in Cambridge. Organizations like these do a great deal, in my view, to enable conversations to take place, which when they start may seem to be at the margins of relevance, but as they develop, go to the heart of conciliation between communities. And what I believe will happen in the end, which is making the kind of Islamist violence, violence in the name of Islam, though not of Islam, which um, has changed the world in many ways, seem an irrelevance within a generation. I'm reasonably optimistic about the long-term future about this issue. But one of the things that the ICSR which I regard, does, which I regard as essential, is the nurturing of leadership. When I was um, carrying out the independent oversight of the uh, PREVENT review, the review of the PREVENT strand of UK counterterrorism policy, the one thing that struck me most strongly as I went around the country is the shortage of leaders. That is not to say that there are no leaders, there are some very good leaders. But the shortage of leaders who are prepared to stand up and be counted, to put their head above the parapet. It's very important for government to be able to talk to leaders, not of the Muslim community, because there is no Muslim community, of the Muslim communities. I was born and used to be an MP in Wales, and there is no more a Muslim community than there is a Welsh community. There are certain things that bind us together, but just as Wales has, in the village where I lived, Beriw Church and Chapel, and sometimes at least the twain shall not meet. But equally in the Muslim communities in this country, we have different nationalities, different theological threads, different aspirations, different community to traditions. And uh, we need leaders from all these parts of the Muslim communities so that we can build not um, a, a, a unity, because I believe strength is in diversity, but a partnership in diversity. And um, I believe that uh, schools like this, departments like this, and the organizations I've mentioned make a considerable contribution to that. I was, um, John only got one date wrong, which is not bad for an academic. I was the uh, independent reviewer of terrorism legislation from 2001 until 2000, until the 18th of February 2011. And I still do some work in that context, though in Northern Ireland only now. But I experienced 10 years in which, starting from zero, because I knew precious little about terrorism when I received a phone call on the 11th of September 2001, as it happens a few hours before the Twin Towers occurred, um, I started from zero and spent 10 years with most of my working life devoted to counter-terrorism policy, law, and practice. Not the criminal cases. I've never appeared in a terrorism criminal case because I was conflicted out of doing so. If anyone would care to send me a brief now, I could do it. But um, until the 18th of February, I was conflicted out. But during my period as independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, now incidentally succeeded by the very distinguished um, lawyer David Anderson QC, whose chambers are just round the corner in Brick Court Chambers in Essex Street, um, I had the privilege as well as the disadvantage of being able to see a lot of material that other people do not see. And therein lies a fundamental problem. Everyone thinks they know something about terrorism. Everyone thinks they know something about counter-terrorism policy. And of course in this room there are some very distinguished individuals who are fine academics and analysts who are able to derive a great deal from various sources about counter-terrorism law and policy. 
The late and much admired by me, Professor Paul Wilkinson of St. Andrews, told me on the first occasion I met him in 2001 that actually not much was very secret anyway. 95% of the material about terrorism was in open sources. And of course, the leaking of websites has probably put a couple more percent into what have become open sources. Nevertheless, there is a residue of secret material that not very many people see and which those who see it are not able to talk about in public. And this is a problem for anyone who works in the area. Um, there's a very distinguished member of my own party here this evening and you know, he and I are good friends but I am not the, the, the most fashionable person to the leadership in my own party because they've disagreed with much that I have said about terrorism. They are, of, in, of course, entitled to their view, but my views, I believe, are evidence-based and not all of theirs are. And there is this gap between political aspiration based on general declarations of political principle, whatever that may be, and an evidence-based analysis of the problem. Or putting it in another way, People trust those they, don't, they, are, that they are prepared to trust, but if they don't want to trust you, they will not trust you, and nothing you say, like I've seen the evidence, will avail in conversation with them. Now I turn to my reflections on counter-terrorism legislation, and I'm going to range fairly widely um, because I hope it will help the discussion later. On the 11th of July of this year, the government announced the reduction in the threat level from severe to substantial. That's for Great Britain, not for Northern Ireland. The threat level is set, as many of you will know, by an organization called JTAC. JTAC is a multidisciplinary organization that sits in the headquarters of the security service in London. Um, it sets the threat level independently in the sense that it is not open to ministers to disagree with that threat level and change it. The threat level announced as severe, um, reduced from substantial, is in my view a realistic appraisal on the evidence, but it does mean what it says. It means severe. If it was moderate, they would say moderate. So please do not assume that because there have been not many terrorist events recently that it isn't happening. And the threat level is founded on a combination of two factors. Obviously on threat, which is a, an analysis of intelligence, broadly speaking, but it is also founded to an extent on the assessment of risk. And risk is different from threat. I'll give you a simple example. The Olympic Games are going to occur and the Paralympics in London next summer. Plainly, there is a risk, even if there is no intelligence of a specific threat, that there will be terrorism events related to the Olympic Games. Plainly also, there is a risk, even though there may be no evidence of threat, I don't know, that um, terrorism events might be planned to take place not at the Olympic Games, but away from the Olympic Games. For example, um, I was actually, although I come from Wales, I was brought up in Burnley, Lancashire. A terrorism event in what I rather quaintly call a dance hall in Burnley, which killed 200 people, and please don't, if the Burnley Express are present, please don't assume I'm suggesting it will happen. It's merely a random example. Would cause just as much mayhem, actually, as the death of 200 people at the Olympic Games. If it happened at the Olympic Games, then people would say, why do, aren't they guarding the Olympic Games properly? If it happens at the Locarno Ballroom in Burnley, then they will say, why did we drop our guard everywhere else why the, while the Olympic Games was going on? So the a threat level of severe is evidence-based, but also takes into account risk. The evidence is largely intelligence. And I have banged my head for nearly 10 years against a very hard wall, trying to persuade some of my political friends and colleagues that there is a difference between intelligence and evidence. 
Why did we introduce control orders after the Belmarsh provisions were struck down? We introduced them because there are people against whom prosecutions cannot be brought because people like me, i.e. QCs, will, 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 will um, test all the evidence uh, in court according to the rules of admissibility of evidence. And there's a great deal of material which is robust, but it is intelligence, not evidence. We can't call it in court because it might not be admissible for one reason or another, or it might be impossible to call it. Take a simple example, because it's uh, information that has been given in great confidentiality by, for example, the mum or dad of a putative terrorist. And that's not a fanciful example at all. Or it may have been obtained by an agent, a reliable agent, who provides information to the British security services and the British government, whose identity, if revealed, would bring about the end of their life. So there are cases, and those are but two examples, where intelligence cannot be turned into evidence. Now we'd run into another problem, and I hesitate to say this with Professor Friedman in the room, because he's a member of a certain commission that, uh, whose report we're waiting for with completely bated breath, and I mean that, in due course, the Iraq inquiry, the dodgy dossier, as it's become called. Now, the dodgy dossier has absolutely nothing to do with counter-terrorism within the UK. It's a completely different form of intelligence, in a, prepared in a completely different way. However, try telling some of my friends in Parliament that, particularly members of the House of Commons. The dodgy dossier, whether dodgy or not, has acquired the reputation of dodginess, and that reputation has affected the assessment of intelligence by anybody who has a passing interest in this field. Um, I was an MP for 14 years, so I can say this. The average attention span of a viewer of a television image is always said to be seven seconds. The average attention span to any point by an average MP who is extremely busy, and I'm very sympathetic to the work they have to do because I've done it, and it's very interesting, but it's very hard work, might just about reach seven seconds. So persuading a member of parliament who has already got preconceptions that all this is completely outrageous anyway and the security <laughs> services are taking part in torture all over the world and everything they do isn't worth listening to, the prospect of persuading such a person or a journalist who's predisposed against you that um, intelligence actually on the whole is pretty carefully analyzed is pretty small. On the other hand, I've spent some extremely boring hours sitting in a small windowless room in the home office. I was once criticized for having an office in the home office. I only used to go there in extremis. Uh, it was known jokingly in the family as Shangri-La. It was so depressing a place uh, that uh, I only went there when I absolutely had to read material I couldn't take anywhere else. But I spent many, many days in there reading material I couldn't take anywhere else. And believe me or not as you wish, but the truth is that the sort of intelligence that's um, put together, for example, for the control order cases, is on the whole very robust, it's very carefully thought out, it's much more corroborated than evidence in most criminal cases these days. Usually there is a significant level of corroboration which is not required in an evidence-based inquiry, and in my view we should pay it greater respect than we do. Of course, all counter-terrorism work beyond the technical is the product of experience and reflects the changing counter-terrorism scene. It's art, not science. In this kind of work, uh, mistakes will be made and are often understandable. This is not an area in which, generally speaking, excoriating criticism of ministers 
across the floor of either House of Parliament is helpful. All bar extremists should be on the same side. And in my view, where differences of opinion occur, they should be debated calmly to produce the best outcome in the national interest. That used to happen in the House of Commons in relation to Northern Ireland, when things were much worse than they are now in Northern Ireland, though we must not put down our guard because of pretty bad things going on there at the moment. For some reason which I've never fully understood, um, party advantage has been taken as a reason for not treating um, the current terrorism issue as being multi-partisan. I mean, some extraordinary events have occurred, not least, and I can say this op freely now, I'm not the independent review of terrorism legislation anymore, the disgraceful resignation of David Davis to fight a by-election on a very narrow issue on which, in my view, he was ill-informed relating to counter-terrorism law. Now, what about the approach we take to counter-terrorism law? Well, the first thing is that we must be absolutely clear that there is no Islamophobia in the law we make or the way in which we implement it. That is absolutely essential. We will only achieve de-radicalization, the avoidance of radicalization, in my view, through partnerships, um, and we will not achieve anything through the sloppy use of language to which I will turn. Um, some very serious mistakes have been made, and I'll give you just two. As it turned out, the Belmarsh provisions turned out to be a serious mistake, and looking back on it, and you know, I'm freely willing to admit that I was wrong about part of this at least, holding people in custody was not right um, when they had not been tried, and in my view it's a very different issue from control orders. The other small example I was going to give was the way in which um, large numbers of closed circuit television cameras and so on, ANPR cameras, were erected in certain parts of Birmingham, costing uh, six million pounds, which immediately produced the understandable reaction that communities were being targeted and being spied upon. It was an entirely justifiable reaction. It was a foolish waste of public money, as the uh, West Midlands Police Authority told me themselves a few months ago. They were never switched on. It cost half a million pounds to take them down. Happily, they've proved at least some of them to be reusable around the Olympic Park. So at least we'll get some value out of a few of them. But those are the sorts of mistakes we should be able to learn not to make, albeit it's understandable in a difficult area like this when we're learning as we go along that mistakes will be made. We also should learn from events around the world. You know that great Macmillan thing when he was asked what had, effect, what had affected his life most? Events, dear boy, events. Well, look at some of the events that have occurred in recent months. We've had the death of bin Laden. We've had the very recent death of al-Awlaki. We've had the Arab Spring. We have the um, continuing revolution in Syria which I believe and certainly hope will eventually lead to some kind of regime change there, though we can't be certain, of course, about what, just as we can't be certain about re the nature of regime change in Egypt or Libya or anywhere else. These are uncertain times. But we should go with the flow of the times. If there are people to talk to, if they have a diaspora in the United Kingdom particularly, then we should talk to them and ensure that we use the natural flow of events rather than any form of authoritarian legislation to uh, help ourselves out of the extremist problems we've encountered. We also have to work against discrimination. Support for extremism is often associated with a perception of discrimination and in some cases with experience of racial, social or religious harassment. It's also a consequence that a sense of victimhood is sometimes created. And if there is a sense of victimhood created, 
that will be preyed upon by extremists. The dissipation um, of this sense of victimhood, which is rarely justified in any objective way, is a proper and important part of counterterrorism activity. Actions and languages that may exacerbate mistaken perceptions should always be avoided and challenged when they occur. And we should not be afraid to challenge them with confidence, however respected or respectable the source from which they come. For example, the remarks even of Muhammad Abdul Bari, former secretary of the Muslim Council of Britain, have included the extravagant warning that the treatment of Muslims in Britain might eventually lead to comparison with the Nazis in Germany. Well, in my view, remarks of that kind have the effect, however inadvertently, of feeding assertions of victimhood and, to put it at its lowest, are unhelpful. More recently, at an event in London on the 21st of May 2011, the advertisements billed the event as part of the, I quote, campaign against anti-Muslim hatred in Britain. Now, when posters of that kind appear all over London or in magazines and so on, what they're doing is not only use, making an infelicitous use of language, but they're making an infelicitous use of implicit language too, which should be questioned strongly as to whether it's constructive. On another occasion, the, in November 2010, a minister, foreign office minister in parliament, described the Muslim Association of Britain, the MAB, as being the Muslim Brotherhood's representative in the United Kingdom. It's not for me to judge that comment, as such comments do not matter for the purposes, for example, of prevent, which interests me. But my plea is for proportionate care to be taken in the use of language. Furthermore, I think we have to choose our friends wisely. Um, government in particular owes a responsibility to the public to choose its friends and partners wisely. And if government works with a given group, it ought to take proportionate care to ensure that it's not actually feeding extremism, but is challenging extremism. And what I'm really saying is that there's a great responsibility on all, especially respected senior figures, to emphasize the benefits of the cohesiveness of Britain and to heal divisions where they exist. This applies equally to politicians, commentators, and others who even accidentally demonize Muslims or for, ex for, or for any other group for that matter, for it feeds prejudice and undermines prevent and the interfaith organizations and all other activities designed with a healing purpose. But I think we should also, another thing I think we should avoid is what the Americans in my view have sometimes done, which is imposing what they believe to their, be their ethical standards on others almost unchanged. Now, I have real doubts that if you look at the history of Afghanistan, for example, it's really realistic to expect some kind of American or British or Dutch style democracy to be put in place within a few years in that country because they've never really had one. And the same would apply to many other countries around the world. So in our work, um, in countering terrorism around the world and in our discussion with other countries in particular, I think we have to avoid the danger of being patronizing, which can be done with goodwill, inadvertently, but very mistakenly. We criticize, and I emphasize rightly in my view, some of the activities of the government of Israel. And indeed, if, as I have, you go to the West Bank or you look at some of those checkpoints where people with lorry loads of fruit are made to wait for two hours in the baking sun because the conscripts have gone off from the check gate 
to have their lunch. And it really happens, I've seen it happen, and the fruit in the lorry is rotten by, because the refrigerator stopped working by the time it's inspected. That, of course, is worthy of serious criticism. But we should remember that we do not live in Israel. We do not live in a situation in which my friend there, who works for the Israeli Foreign Service, went, to, to, went from the office for a cup of coffee after work one day with some of his colleagues, and 13 of them were blown to pieces in his presence. We don't live in a situation where that threat presents itself day by day. Um, I think that there are some pretty questionable things happening in Pakistan. I believe that um, if one looks at Pakistan regional government, um, certainly regional government, you see widespread evidence of corruption. And in my view, it's difficult to understand how Osama bin Laden apparently uh, led a straightforward life undetected for however many years it was. But we don't live in Pakistan. It's a very different place. It's a very different scene. They could do a great deal more. For example, my observation is the uncontrolled nature of the huge number of madrasas, the fact that there's not even a licensing system, that you see students from these madrasas walking through Islamabad. I'm sure most of them are very good madrasas, but there are some that are rogue madrasas, and it's all uncontrolled. But we aren't there. And imposing our standards on a very different kind of country is difficult, and we ought not to patronize them over it. That's why I support the view that we should at least attempt to, su to support the Pakistan government insofar as it is prepared to make serious efforts against uh, al-Qaeda and its fraternal groups. So taking all that into account, we come to current British legislation. Now, when the coalition was formed, it was formed by two parties, one of which was wholly opposed to any form of legislation that didn't actually attract the gut liberal. So, for example, the Liberal Democrats, my own party, against my will, went into the election saying, control orders will be abolished. The Conservative Party took a slightly more cautious view. They said, we'll have a review of counter-terrorism law. We had a review of counter-terrorism law, and I'm mentioning this issue because it's so topical. On Wednesday, we shall be debating the TPIMS bill, second reading in the House of Lords, Terrorism Prevention and Investigation Measures Bill, which replaces control orders with TPIMS. Now, you'll recall, as I said a moment ago, that the Liberal Democrats were in favor of abolishing control orders, albeit without having read any of the evidence before the election. They probably asked to. They probably were refused. I don't think that should happen. I think government should share more of this evidence with suitably vetted members of opposition parties, but that was the way it was. The counterterrorism review took place. I absolutely agree with Nick Clegg that we should do what is right and not what is easy. The uh, mantra of his conference speech at this year's Liberal Democrat conference. I'm afraid on control orders, as I shall say on Wednesday, we're doing what's easy and not what is right. The evidence that has emerged since the election is that control orders are needed. TPIMs are almost control orders by another name. They're not going to have curfews, but they're going to have overnight stays. Well, somebody here, there will be some philosophers here who might be able to tell me the difference between a curfew and an overnight stay, particularly as it will be in the hands of the judge to define what is a curfew as opposed to an overnight stay. But the one thing that they have decided to remove from control orders and not put into TPIMs are relocation, is relocation. Now, relocation is a power to order a person to live in a specified place. It might be Burnley, for example. And the purpose of, I mean, living in Burnley is wonderful, of course, 
but sending them to Burnley might take them away from the people with whom they've been conversing about terrorism. Um, those relocation orders are not merely policed, but they are adjudged. Every one of those cases automatically goes before a High Court judge and it's analysed. And in every single case, a special advocate is interposed who sees all the closed material, all the secret material, and makes submissions to the court as he or she thinks fit in the interests of the person whose interests they represent. Relocation has been supported by the judges, not in every case, but in most cases where it's occurred. But of course, we had a new government and it set its face against relocation. So one would expect that the government, having decided it didn't need relocation, didn't ask for it anymore. No. In May of this year, in a case called CD, Mr. Justice Simon, in the High Court, gave a detailed and cogent judgment in which he uh, found that relocation was necessary and proportionate in a particular case. Why did Mr. Justice Simon make, give that judgment at all? Because he was asked to. Who was he asked to do it by? But by the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary in which government? This government, the very government that says relocation is no longer required. Well, I'm afraid that has me scratching my head. There was another case in the Court of Appeal this year where, in more broad terms, relocation was supported and it was supported on submissions made on behalf of the Home Secretary in this government. So the evidence is overwhelming that relocation is a significant part, as the judge recognised, as Mr Justice Simon recognised, in counter-terrorism provision in this country. So what does the government do? Well, it can't say that relocation is never necessary. So instead of including it in TPIMs, which they could do perfectly simply, they decide to have a piece of reserve legislation which will be subject to pre-legislative scrutiny, but will not be passed through Parliament until it's needed. There will be a power in the Secretary of State to um, bring it into force in an emergency, but that will be subject to a debate in both Houses of Parliament. Well, just look at the situation. Mr. Carlyle, terrorist, is a, a subject for relocation. It's absolutely necessary to get him out of his hometown of Burnley and put him in Wath-on-Dern, where he can cause far less trouble. So a parliamentary debate takes place, what, in which they debate Mr. Carlyle's case. That's fair. That doesn't prejudice a hearing against him. Of course, it's complete nonsense. Further, if you were to ask any parliamentary council, and they keep their views to themselves, these people, but I know what they think, as to whether this is a satisfactory form of legislation, of course they say no. It's absolute nonsense. But in this instance, it's entered into um, a, an arrangement which is reflected in the fact that the most popular line in the House of Commons gift shop is parliamentary fudge. Um, and I regret that very much because I want to be able to support my government. I don't want to criticise them. And I most certainly don't want to criticise them for being disreputably pragmatic. And I'm afraid that is, what, that is what has happened. The same has happened with the 14 or 28 days detention between arrest and charge issue. I could go into at least as much detail on that subject. And I regret very much that the danger of coalition politics is that it can be the enemy of reason. I do, of course, recognise, indeed, I enthusiastically support, enthusiastically support the view that counter-terrorism legislation should be compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. I do not support the repeal of the Human Rights Act. 
I do support the modernization of the European Convention on Human Rights, and I think the British government should take the lead on that. And I do support the creation of a British Bill of Rights, which is compatible in every respect with the, Europe, with the European Convention, but puts it into a British context, a British context for our time. I think that there are large numbers of rights which are not dealt with in the Convention, information rights, privacy rights in a way that we can understand, issues relating to the deportation of people whose presence is contrary to the national interest and the level of risk that they face in their home countries. These are all issues that are worthy of reform and debate. But I do support the European Convention on Human Rights and I recognize that no counter-terrorism law should be incompatible with the Convention. But I believe that in some respects, politicians in particular, and some commentators, particularly in the Westminster Village, have got the balance wrong, that we do need to be just a little bit more robust than we have been, and that, for example, control orders at the present time represent part of the right side of the balance, not the wrong side of the balance. I have a solution to this, which I shall be uh, presenting to the House of Lords on Wednesday, which is that they should put relocation back into TPIMS and that it should have an automatic repeal after the Olympic Games, subject to an affirmative resolution of both Houses of Parliament. In effect, this would give us the opportunity to reconsider the issue after the Olympic Games were over and in the light of, no doubt, the large amount of intelligence which will abound around that those events. So, um, I've forgotten what the title of this was. Yes, an expert's perspective. Well, it's hard to be expert in this subject, but I've tried to give you a little bit of perspective. Uh, it's my perspective of a changing counter-terrorism legal scene. My real concern is about the quality of legislation. I think that the government is not quite there on the quality of, le of its legislation. In the quality of its legislation, it needs to remember the aims of the prevent strand of counterterrorism policy, which in my view, though imperfect, is better described now than it was before the prevent review emerged just a few months ago. Thank you. A question and answer session was also held where the war on terrorism was discussed. You mentioned al in passing. I struggle to how legally is the best way to handle somebody who inspires somebody to kill, but who actually doesn't have any fingerprints on the murder? How do you legally analyze al and the al cases? I mean, I think what I would say about al is that if al had been found in South End on Sea, then I think we would be able to bring a perfectly respectable prosecution on an abundance of evidence against our Laki for an inchoate crime such as incitement, if not conspiracy, one might go be able to go even further than incitement. And um, I don't see in international um, criminal law why um, the legal position is any different. I have to recognize, though, that I think that international law is a conceptual and dynamic creature and it's, develop, it's being developed as we go along in a different way from domestic law because domestic law is subject to domestic legislation which is, uh, in our country at least, not even purposive. I'm the National President of the Andean Muslim Association United Kingdom. Firstly, can I thank Lord Carlyle for his very enlightened speech this evening. Uh, <clears throat> you touched on the legislation but you did not touch on the issues. Uh, relating to counterterrorism, Recently, in the House of Parliament and also in the European Parliament, we had two debates on extremism. And during these debates, one of the issues that came up is the funding of madrasas by the Saudi government, both in Pakistan and also in other countries. Charles Tanak recently came back from Ethiopia, and the Prime Minister of Ethiopia said to Charles that in his country, very recently there's been radicalization because 
the Saudis have been supporting madrasas in his country and he's seen a drastic change which they cannot control. When Pakistan was originally uh, <coughs> created, the aspirations were that we would have a secular, so secular society where everyone will have freedom to practice their faith. We, the Ahmadis, have seen how we have been uh, targeted in that country. And a lot of this comes from those people who come out of the madrasas. And these people, even yesterday, they murdered one gentleman who had converted to our community from, from the main Muslim group. And just because he converted, he was shot dead. What we are also seeing is some of these radical preachers coming to the United Kingdom. And I'm sure that the British government is aware of this, but because of freedom of speech in this country, they failed to tackle this robustly. And I'd like to know why is it that we allow these preachers, they come in, we have lots of uh, Pakistani television stations here now, and if you listen to some of the preachers, the hate that they're spreading through this media and also through the internet is, uh, is amazing. And yet nobody's doing anything about it. And I'd like to ask the panel what action can be taken, both in terms of um, penalizing the Saudi government for supporting madrasas in various countries and radicalizing people there, and secondly, the preachers being allowed into this country and spreading the hate message in this country. Um. It's, it's a very important question. There is a lot of evidence that Saudi-funded Saudi funded preachers have fomented hatred in the United Kingdom and in other countries. Um, as to what we can do with the Saudi government, let's be realistic about this. The prospects of, the British, of any British government... Uh, that was just a message from the Saudi government. Um, <laughs> The, the prospects of any British government taking any meaningful steps, or any Western government taking any meaningful steps at the moment against the Saudi government are nil. So we have to do it another way. Now, we've seen recently one uh, error made at a port in relation to one individual who had been refused entry to the United Kingdom, which demonstrates that the, the, the steps that can be taken don't always work anyway. Uh, my view is that preachers who come to this country should be much more rigorously examined before they're allowed to enter here. Their credentials should be examined much, with, with much greater attention. Um, and I believe that we could achieve quite a lot by that means. I think it's also fair to say that there is now a, I hope it's not too extravagant a word, a flowering of British-based, British-educated preachers in many mosques, I've met a few who are of a completely different kind and who understand that we're all members of the same community, we're all members of the same society, of the same country, and they're doing good work. And, you know, some of the organ interfaith organizations, I, I mentioned the Wolf Institute, but there are, there are others doing a tremendous job um, in London in particular, have a, a lot to achieve on that front. At the close of the event, the key speakers gave their remarks on how the event had gone. Uh, absolutely. Um, well, it, it's, the event here today is based in King's College London, uh, and as we uh, uh, talked about earlier, Zafar Khan is a uh, alumnus of King's College London, as is Lord Carlyle, both in the uh, law department, both from the law department at uh, King's College London. So really we thought it was absolutely crucial uh, and also very appropriate event to have to discuss the issue of extremism, counter-terrorism legislation, um, this sort of broader um, anti-radicalization anti message, um, and to have it here um, with two alumnus of the, of, of the uh, law department was, was fantastic for us. Um, there, uh, there is a great need to look at international trade closely to ensure that trade deals are not used, for example, money laundering for terrorists. Equally, there is some evidence that charitable organizations in this country are laundering money for terrorism. Um, another problem with trade is that re trade relations between nations are such that trade can sometimes trump almost everything else. British relations with Saudi Arabia, for example, are a huge economic consequence, and government is perhaps understandably unenthusiastic 
about any form of sanction against the funding of uh, imams of a particular kind by the Saudi Arabian government or Saudi Arabian agencies. So it's a very difficult issue, but I think we do need to keep a very careful watch on funding. And I am currently involved in an organized attempt to ensure that charities in particular are not used as a vehicle for funding of terrorism elsewhere. The winner of the Zafrullah Khan Essay Prize explained the conclusion of her essay on whether Jinnah's vision could be revived in Pakistan. Um, and my argument was that religion has really been used as a, pow as a, pow a power tool. So politicians have, they haven't been implementing this vision and I concluded that it would be really hard to revive that vision because religion has been used as a tool to divide communities, to get political support. Um, that was the conclusion.